Chapter 8, Section 7. Why is the history of capitalism important? Simply because it provides us with an understanding of whether that system is natural and whether it can be considered just and free. If the system was created by violence, state action, and other unjust means, then the apparent freedom which we currently face within it is a fraud. A fraud masking unnecessary and harmful relations of domination, oppression, and exploitation. Moreover, by seeing how capitalist relationships were viewed by the first generation of wage slaves remind, uh, reminds us that just because many people have adjusted to this regime and consider it normal or even natural, it's nothing of the kind. Murray Rothbard is well aware of the importance of history. He considered the moral indignation of socialism arises from the argument that the capitalists have stolen the rightful property of the workers and therefore the existing titles to accumulated capital are unjust. He argues that given this hypothesis, the remainder of the impetus for both Marxism and anarcho-syndicalism follow, quote, logically. So, oh, by the way, that's found on Ethics of Liberty by Rothbard, page 52, Zone Admittance. So some right libertarians are aware that current property owners have benefited extensively from violence and state action in the past. Rothbard argues on page 57 of the Ethics of Liberty that if the just owners cannot be found for a property, then the property simply becomes again unowned and will belong to the first person to appropriate and utilize it. If the current owners are not the actual criminals, then there's no reason at all to dispossess them of the property. If the just owners cannot be found, then they may keep the property as the first people to use it. Of course, those who own capital and those who are using it are different people usually, but we'll ignore that obvious point. Thus, since all original owners and originally the originally dispossessed are long dead, nearly all current title owners are in just possession of their property, except for recently stolen property. The principle is simple. Dispossess the criminals, restore property to the dispossessed if they can be found, otherwise leave titles where they are. As Na Native Americans own, uh, tribes own the land collectively, this could have an interesting effect on such a policy in the U.S. Obviously, tribes that were wiped out need not apply, but would such right libertarian policies recognize such collective non-capitalist ownership claims? I doubt it, but could be wrong. The Libertarian Party Manifesto states that their just property rights be, will be restored. And who defines just, by the way? Oh, that's right. And given that unclaimed federal land will be given to Native Americans, it seems pretty likely that the original land will be left alone. Of course, this instantly gives an advantage to the wealthy on the new pure market isn't mentioned anywhere. The large corporations that, via state protection and support, built their empires and industrial base will still be in an excellent position to continue to dominate the market. Wealthy landowners benefiting from the effects of state taxation and rents caused by the land monopoly on farmstead failures will keep their property. The rich will have great initial advantage, and this may be more than enough to maintain them in their place. After all, exchanges between worker and owner tend to reinforce existing inequities, uh, inequalities, not reduce them. And as the owners can move their capital elsewhere or import new lowered wage uh, workers from across the world, it's likely to stay that way. So Rothbard's solution to the problem of past force seems to be essentially a justification of existing property titles and not a serious attempt to understand or correct passion, past initiations of force that have shaped society into a capitalist one and still shape it to today. The end result of his theory is to leave things pretty much as they are, for the past criminals are dead and so are their victims. However, what Rothbard, Rothbard fails to note is the results of the state action and coercion are still with us. He totally fails to consider that the theft of productive wealth has a greater impact on society than the theft itself. The theft of productive wealth shapes society in so many ways that all suffer from it, including current generations. This, the externalities generated by theft, cannot be easily undone by individualistic solutions. Let's take an example, somewhat more useful than the, Roth, uh, the one that Rothbard uses, namely a stolen watch. A watch can't really be used to generate wealth, although I suppose if I steal a watch, sell it, and buy a winning lottery ticket, it doesn't mean that I can keep the prize after returning the money value of your watch to you. Without the initial theft, I would not have won the prize, but obviously the prize money far exceeds the amount stolen. Is that prize money mine? Let's take a tool of production rather than a watch. Let's assume a ship sinks and 50 people get washed ashore on an island. One woman 
has the foresight to take a knife from the ship and falls unconscious on the beach. On, on the beach. A man comes along and steals her knife. When the woman awakes, she can't remember if she managed to bring the knife ashore with her or not. The man maintains that he brought it with him and no one else saw anything. The survivors decide to split the island equally between them and work it separately, exchanging goods via barter. However, the man with the knife now has the advantage and soon carves himself a house and fields from the wilderness. Seeing that they needed the knife and the tools created by the knife to go beyond mere existing, some of the other survivors hire themselves to the knife owner. Soon, he's running a surplus of goods, including houses and equipment which he decides to hire out to others. This surplus is then used to tempt more and more of the other islanders to work for him, exchanging their land in return for the goods he provides. Soon he owns the whole island and never has to work again. His hut, well-stocked, extremely luxurious. His workers face the option of knowing his, of following his orders or being fired, i.e. expelled from the island and so back into the water in certain death. Later, he dies and leaves his knife to his son. The woman whose knife it originally was had died long before childless. Note, this example, the theft, did not involve taking any land. All had equal access to it. It was the initial theft of the knife which provided the man with the market power, an edge which allowed him to offer the others a choice between working by themselves or working for him. By working for him, they did benefit in terms of increased material wealth and also made the thief better off. But the accumulate impact of unequal exchanges turned them into effective slaves of the thief. Now, would it really be enough to turn the knife over to whoever happened to be using it once the theft was discovered? Perhaps the thief made a deathbed confession. Even if the woman who had originally taken it from the ship had been alive, would the return of the knife really make up for the years of work the survivors had put in enriching the thief or the voluntary exchanges which had resulted in the thief owning all of the island? The equipment people use, the houses they live in, and the food they eat are all the product of many hours of collective work. Does this mean that the transformation of nature, which the knife allowed to uh, remain in the hands of the descendants of the thief or become the collective property of all? Would dividing it equally between all be fair? Not everyone worked equally hard to produce it. So we have a problem. The result of the initial theft is far greater than the theft considered in isolation due to the product productive nature of what was stolen. <coughs> In other words, what Rothbard ignores in his attempt to undermine anarchist use of history is that when the property stolen is of a productive nature, the accumulative effect of its use is such as to affect all of society. Productive assets produce new property, new values, create new balance of class forces, new income, wealth inequalities, and so on. It's because of this dynamic nature of production in human life. When the theft is such that it creates accumulative effects after the initial act, it's hardly enough to say that it does not really matter anymore. If a nobleman invests in a capitalist firm with the tribute he exacted from his peasants, then, once the firm starts doing well, sells the land to the peasants and uses that money to expand his capitalist holdings, does that really make everything all right? Does not the crime transmit with the cash? After all, the factory would not exist without the prior exploitation of the peasants. In the case of actually existing capitalism, born as it was of extensive coercive acts, the resultant of these acts have come to shape the whole society. For example, the theft of common land plus the enforcement of property rights, the land monopoly, to vast estates owned by the aristocracy ensured that working people had no option to sell their labor to the capitalists, rural or urban. The terms of these contracts reflected the weak position of the workers, and so capitalists extracted surplus value from workers and used it to consolidate their market position and economic power. Similarly, the effect of mercantilist policies and protectionism was to enrich the capitalists at the expense of workers and allow them to build industrial empires. 
The cumulative effect of these acts of a violation of a free market was to create a class society wherein most people consent to be wage slaves and enrich the few. While those who suffered the impositions are long gone and the results of the specific acts have multiplied and magnified well beyond their initial form. And we're still living with them. In other words, the initial acts of coercion have been transmitted and transformed by collective activity, wage labor, into society-wide effects. Rothbard argues, in the situation where the descendants or others of those who initially tilled the soil and their aggressors, or, quote, or those who purchased their claims, still exact, uh, extract tribute from the modern tillers, that is the case of continuing aggression against the true owners. This means that the land titles should be transferred to the peasants without compensation to the monopoly landlords. But what he fails to note is that the extracted tribute could have, not, uh, could have been used to invest in industry and transform society. Why ignore what the tribute has been used for? Does stolen property not remain stolen property after it's been transferred to another? And if the stolen property is used to create a society in which one class has to sell their liberty to another, then surely any surplus coming from those exchanges are also stolen as it was generated directly and indirectly by that theft. Yes, anarchists agree with Rothbard. Peasants should take the land they use, but which is owned by another. But this logic can equally be applied to capitalism. Workers are still living with the effects of past initiations of force, and capitalists still exact tribute from workers due to the unequal bargaining powers within the labor market that's created. The labor market, after all, was created by state action, directly or indirectly, and is maintained by state action to protect property rights and the new initiations of force by working people. The accumulative effect of stealing productive resources has been to increase the economic power of one class compared to another. As the victims of these past abuses are long gone and attempts to find their descendants meaningless because of the generalized effects the thefts in, of the thefts in question, anarchists feel we're justified in demanding the expropriation of the expropriators. Due to Rothbard's failure to understand the dynamic and generalizing effects that result from the theft of productive forces, i.e. externalities that occur from coercion of one person against a specific set of others, and the creation of a labor market, his attempt to refute anarchist analysis of the history of actually existing capitalism also fails. Society is the product of collective activity and should belong to all. Although whether and how we divide it up that's another question.